morning, everyone. Our passage is from the Gospel of Mark, so turn to Mark chapter 10. This morning we have a local pastor, his name is Pastor Gelam Buzia. Uh, he's planting a church in Glendale called All Saints. It's an evangelical Anglican church. And so talk to him about that afterwards. I'm sure there's a lot he can tell you about it. I'm going to read from the 10th chapter of Mark, verses 35 through 40, and then God is going to come up and pray for us. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Amen. That was great. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful and amazing day. Thank you for this family, Lord. This family of church that you gave us, Lord. Help us to be grateful, Lord, whatever we have. Help us not worry about positions in church or outside of church, Lord, and help us be busy worshiping you and, and praising your name, Lord. I want to thank you for today. I want to pray for Esther, Lord, that you, you speak through him, Lord, and prepare our hearts, our minds, Lord, to receive your word, and not only just receive it, but to apply it to our life, Lord. And help us to remember every day what you've done on the cross, Lord, for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Ada and the entire church for this invitation. Uh, I was here a couple of weeks ago, and I was very uh, encouraged by what I saw. Uh, just And the people I've met, everyone been so wonderful. And so, um, like I said, I'm, I'm grateful of being here. And, and I just hope that God uh, would be able to speak to all of us in this room. Uh, and uh, I thank you for the prayer. And I will say just one quick prayer as well, and we'll get right into it. Dear God, I thank you, Lord, for this time. As your words were said and written for the first time, Lord, may they be said and heard again as if they were for the first time, here and now. Use me as an instrument of your peace, of your truth, of your hope. May you touch our hearts and our minds and move us forward towards you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, often we come to church and we say to ourselves, privately, quietly, Lord, give me word today. I need word. I need your word. Give me something so I can go out into the world and somehow affect, maybe in my household, at my workplace, at my school. So we come here eagerly Sunday after Sunday, chomping at the bit, waiting to hear God's word from whoever's up here, being moved by the Spirit through worship and also in fellowship. I wonder if that is truly always the, the most pleasant thing to ask ourselves. You know, sometimes God's word can stir in us and give us insight that we might not be ready for. Sometimes we can come to God saying, Lord, give. But can we handle what he's going to give us? Are we ready for what God is going to give us? Do we know the kinds of questions we are asking God? Do we know the kind of God that we are worshiping? 
Every time we worship, every time we close our eyes, every time we pray, we are encountering God who we can't put a uh, cap on. He is always greater than we thought. He is always more loving than we would have ever imagined. So God is new to us. He should be if God is God. We can't limit God to our own understandings or thoughts or experiences. He's beyond all three of those. So, I think no different than today's passage that we heard, that we read. You know, we ask God these questions. Sometimes we don't know what we're getting ourselves into by asking these questions. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, are following Jesus. And they think Jesus is the Messiah. But their understanding of the Messiah is an earthbound Messiah. Their understanding of the Messiah is the king that's going to come and upstage Rome. And he's going to help rally Israel. And finally, they're going to have their land. Finally, they're going to have liberation that they've been waiting for. You have to understand, for, for the Jews at the time, a king was an earthbound king. If you go back all the way back to Moses, or Joshua, forgive me, Joshua, and then Moses, and then Dan, David, and then Daniel. All of these kingdoms, all of these kings, all of these judges, they've been earthbound. And so their expectations at that time is that somebody would come on a horse, a white war horse, and finally defeat the Romans of the day. And finally they will have liberty and their land so they can worship God freely without any issues, without any deaths, without any fights, anything like that. And so what they're doing here, John and James, they come up to Jesus and say, we want to ask you something. We want you to do something for us. Grant, Jesus says, what is it that you want me to do? Well, grant that one of us sit at your right and one at your left when you come into your glory. They're essentially saying, when you become king, we want to be your prime minister and secretary of defense. We want to have power when you become the king of the land. No more Herod the Great, no more Herod Agrippa at the time. We, not Caesar, you, and we want to have power and control this movement and this empire with you as our king. What does Jesus say? You don't know what you're asking. Now think about it. We want to sit at your right hand and on your left when you come into your glory. When did Jesus come into his glory? At the cross. That's when he first came into his glory, enthroned as the king of kings. Now, let me ask you another question. When Jesus came to his glory, wasn't there somebody to his right and somebody to his left? Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized? Were the disciples there? No. What does that mean for us? Think about it. What does that mean symbolically that there was somebody to his right and to his left? They were crucified as well. Now clearly we know those were thieves, criminals, deserved to be up there. But nevertheless, Jesus is still making the point here for us. You don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're getting yourself into by coming and following me. When I say pick up your cross and follow me, do you know what that means? Do you know what, the, what it means to follow me? What it's going to take? What it's going to demand? What you have to let go of? What you have to grab onto? Are you ready for that? That's what the baptism and the cup is all about. The cup is an Old Testament theme of God's judgment and, and, and wrath. 
And baptism is another symbolic word that Jesus is using about his death. Now, he's not saying you're going to be tortured. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying the walk to follow me, it might be difficult. Are you ready for that? We, we for some reason, we always think we can minimize our faith to, unfortunately, that sometimes we think as long as we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, died on the cross, and rose three days later, we're good. Let me repeat that. As long as we believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, died on the cross, and rose three, late, three days later, I'm fine, I'm a Christian, this is good, I have my insurance policy, I'm going to go to heaven because I believe in these three statements. Jesus is more concerned, Jesus is concerned with more than that. That's true, everything I said is true. But Jesus clearly cared about what takes place here. And he is saying, if you want to be a part of my kingdom, John and James, and us, are you ready? Are you ready to follow me to the way of the cross? The title of this sermon is The Kingdom and the Cross. Because there is no kingdom in this Messiah's kingship without a cross. And we as his disciples, his followers, have to be aware of that. Now some of us, if we've lived long enough in the faith, we can say, you know what, it's been difficult being a Christian all these years. I mean, think about it. You've had to let go of so many things that you otherwise could have had. You've had to sacrifice. You've had to travel. You've had to work. You've had to turn the other cheek. You've had to go the extra mile. How many times? You'd have to take off your cloak and give it to somebody else. How many times? You don't know what you're asking. You know, when I came to, when I became a Christian at the age of 21, I thought this was going to be great. Yes, God touched me. I'm finally living. I'm free. I sense the presence of God in my life now. I'm going to live for Him. And this is going to be exciting. And it has. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. But nowhere in my mind did I ever imagine the life that I would have to deal with. I'm not saying, I'm not complaining. But the amount that, and you know this, if you're following Jesus, you know this. There's so much you have to let go of in this world. The people outside who don't follow Jesus, they're not making decisions. They're not thinking twice about this or that, how to spend their money, who to marry, how to live their lives, how to be in their workplace, how to treat others. We, as followers of Christ, are constantly thinking about these things. Or we should be. We should be. And so following Jesus means understanding that the cross is central to our faith. That his kingdom isn't one of that is just celebrating and it is, is, is one with all comfort. I'm telling you, if our lives are comfortable, we miss something. Remember, Jesus started with 12 disciples. He ended with 11. It is difficult to accept the teachings of Christ. But in accepting those teachings with Christ, we actually have life. So some of us might be in this room today saying, my life has been difficult. It's difficult right now. It would have been a lot easier if I wasn't a Christian, maybe. How much I've had to endure whether family or friends, whether they've mocked you or persecuted you, or left you out of their parties or invitations because you're the Christian, because they know eventually in 15 minutes the conversation might turn and your God is going to come out. And you say to yourself, is it worth it? Yes. Yes. We are called to bear the image of God in this world. When we think about the image of God, we think of a mirror, and we're looking at it directly. And so I have morals and ethics. I know what right and wrong is because I possess 
the image of God. I want to challenge us today and think of the image of God differently, and it will make sense, I believe, to our passage today. Think of the image of God as an angled mirror, not a straight mirror. An angled mirror. Now imagine you're in your room, your door is slightly open, and you have a mirror on your door. Somebody walks through the house, you can see. You can see who came in, are you going to come out and greet them? You can see them through that mirror. Your ref their reflection is shown. And vice versa, they can see you if they're looking at that mirror inside your room. Us, as followers of Christ, who seek to bear the image of God, should see ourselves as a reflection of Him to the world. Him to the world. We reflect God's goodness, beauty, truth, love, mercy for the world. Image of God is not something that we possess and think about ourselves. No, we actually have a role to play. We are participants. And so when Jesus is confronting these, these two disciples of his, when he says, you don't know what you're asking for, this is exactly what he's saying. It's not for you, this kingdom. You're not going to have power, what you thought power was all about. You actually have to let it go. You're not going to be my Secretary of State and Prime Minister and, and lord it over people. No, you're going to live a life that is giving and generous to sacrifice. So what Jesus does, he flips the kingdom idea, the concept of the kingdom to us. It's an upside-down kingdom. Everything that you thought was right becomes wrong. Everything that you thought was wrong becomes right. He redefines what love and power and glory is. Or rightly defines what love, power, and glory is in God's mind and God's heart. Are we ready to follow this Jesus? Are we ready to sit at his right and to his left? In the midst of that, we are encouraged that Jesus said, I am always with you. As the Father has sent me, I too send you now. And Jesus breathed on them. And the Holy Spirit received the Holy Spirit, he said. So we are not alone as his disciples, as his followers in this world. Will it be difficult? Sure. Will we have to make some sacrifices? Yes. Will we, will we be mocked, persecuted, forgotten, neglected, abandoned, ridiculed, shamed, ignored, hurt, abused? Yes. But is there any way other than that? I mean, if no, Jesus said, no servant is greater than his master. If the world hates you, know that it hated me first. They will flog you, they will persecute you, they will put you before courts, but do not be afraid, for the Holy Spirit, your helper, will be with you. And at that hour, at that moment, you will know what to say and what to do. Those words ring true today as it did 2,000 years ago to his early disciples. And so we have no fear, but we have to understand who it is that we're worshiping and where he is taking us. He is taking us to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where the cross is. In our lives, we have to keep sight of that. But it's in that that we get the glory. It's in that that we reign with God. It's in that that we participate. And that is what God wants to do. In and through us, for the sake of the world, as an angled mirror, so people can see who He is 
and what power really looks like, what love really looks like. The kingdom and the cross, there could be no other way for Jesus. A crown of thorns, not one of gold. A donkey, not, one, not a white stallion. What are we after? Who are we worshiping? What is it about this faith that is so attractive? The world doesn't see it. I hope we do. Be encouraged. If you're going through a difficult time because of your faith, be encouraged. Jesus said, I overcome, I have overcome this world. He is protecting us and he is with us. Let us seek to sit at his right and to his left. And then we will see his glory as it truly is. <clears throat> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. I hope, Lord, that you help us ask the right questions. Sometimes we might have the right answers to the wrong questions, God. Help us ask the right questions and understand what it is that we're committing to, to do in following you. Help us see that it is in giving in laying down our lives for others. That is the way to the cross. That is being with you. Help us see it and not, Lord, regret it, but choose the narrow gate, the narrow road, the narrow way, for that leads to life. All other roads, wide as they may be, easy as they may to follow, lead to destruction. Be with us. I pray a blessing over this church, all its members, all who's come in and out of these doors, and may they encounter you, Lord, in word and spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.